In this video, we have a quantitative methods and a machine learning and a modeling expert telling us why all the models that we have heard in the news which predict when Corona is going to end don't work really well. And he's also going to share about how Corona was taken care by the Ontario government in Canada. What are the preparations, how is vaccination being done, how testing is being done and how the uh, healthcare infrastructure is responding to it. Hello all, we are here in this very important COVID awareness video and you know today we have Mr. Pradyum Singh with us. Mr. Pradyum Singh is a machine learning engineer based out of Toronto who has masters in modeling and quantitative methods. You know why we have him today is because A, he is based out of Toronto and is going to tell us how situation is there in Canada and you know what India and Delhi can learn from it. Number two, being an expert at modeling, we're going to ask him a few questions regarding how uh, mathematical models work. You know, the models that you see about predictions, the models that you see about when COVID is going to end, we have been seeing them from as back as mid and early 2020s. And, you know, some of them have failed. So he's going to tell us about that. So first of all, uh, good morning, uh, Pradyum. How are you this morning? Yeah, I'm doing absolutely great. And thank you for having me, Raja. Uh, I hope everything's okay on your side. I know Delhi is not doing great right now. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's not in the best of uh, best of the shapes right now, but we are definitely, yeah. you know, on a better path now as compared to where we were four weeks back. So, you know, one very important question, you know, since you are a qualified, uh, you know, modeler, mm -hmm. mathematical modeler, and you do work right. with a lot of yeah. data, you know, we have been yeah. seeing people modeling the end of COVID right from when it started. I know I was so excited in 2020 when I was sure in March that it's going to end in June 2020. But we are now mm -hmm. in May. That's just one year, about an year after, you know, it was predicted to end. So tell us more about these models and, you know, these forecasts and how these models work and what are, what are they based on and why do they fail? Right. So, uh, so you, you, you said that it's going to be ending in June, 2020, right? I think I heard, I heard, I had similar stories that it should be done by the summer. Uh, so, <laughs> so the thing is any kind of modeling that you do, right. There is going to be a certain part of it that you'll have to pick up from the real world data, right? Like you cannot just build something completely like out of nothing. Right? You cannot build a model out of nothing. It has to be based on at least a certain part of it. it has to be based on some real data, right? And at that given time, uh, we just did not have that kind of data because a lot of that data, like we we we, are, we were in really so the most affected country of COVID at that point of time. Like right? we're talking about, like you know, February and March of 2020, it was China, right? And we weren't really getting as much data as we would like to have. Right. So you can only do so much. Uh, people, of course, uh, made assumptions regarding the, the very popular R factor. I think I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about it. Uh, just so, to tell people, just to tell people, R naught is the reproduction number. So if one person gets it, how many more people is going to get infected, you know, with because he's got it? That is the R naught number. So please go ahead with what you're saying. Right. Uh, so, so that that will affect your R R not quite a quite a bit, right? Uh, and of course, we didn't have enough information regarding the virus itself, right? Uh, so, of course, viruses mutate, right? Like that's that's th that always happens, right? But they will mutate even more if it ex if it exists in a population for a longer period of time, or if it exists in a large amount of population, right? So the nature of this virus itself is that not everybody really shows symptoms, right? So a lot of people, they just become hosts, they just keep shedding it, and eventually they shed all of it, right? So so the num as the numbers of viruses grow, it the chances of mutations increase, right? So uh, the, just by the nature of this uh, virus, it is, it, it is almost impossible to really, really model how virulent it, it's really going to get, right? Or, uh, right? And also... We, d we didn't know anything about antibodies, like how long do they last in a person, right? So if you have it, are you going to get it again? Or is it going to be as bad as the previous one? Or even if you get it, are you going to be asymptomatic, 
right? Because even if you're asymptomatic, you're still going to be spreading, right? So we, we did not have any of those uh, answers, right? So you can only do so much. Uh, and even after all of that information, uh, it's 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 nearly impossible because see, uh, if I were to really sum up modeling in a, in the most basic of ways, it's about using all the different variables, right? All the different factors that exist uh, that are trying to affect a certain uh, value, right? Or, or, or a certain condition or a certain uh, phenomena, right? That's all there is to it, right? Using all the different factors and do it. Now, to know all of these different factors is the toughest of challenge, right? Or do we even have access to those factors, right? To quantify those factors, right? To give solid number, get solid numbers out of those factors. So it's 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 nearly impossible to get it right, but they do serve their purpose. Uh, so because you st so see you keep hearing the R not value, right? Like that's I think that is really helpful for policy decisions, uh, and that's kind of what a lot of people have actually used to actually design a lot of uh, uh, a lot of COVID related uh, uh, COVID related restrictions. Uh, how uh, like you know. How many people can really stay in in a, in a certain location? Things of that sort. Like they're all dependent on just this. So, so when you say so when you say that this modeling, even though it's not accurate, but it can be the basic cue. It can be the basic guiding point for governments to decide their policy, to decide lockdowns, and to decide you know what what are the population that has to be vaccinated and all the other preventive and curative measures. But when I say that, how can you know because you're a machine learning person? How can we constantly improve our algorithms to make this data and this forecast, especially, more and more accurate? Uh, so they are trying to make it accurate, right? But then again, nobody could have seen uh, what, what happened in India, right? Like uh, you know, the first wave, everybody predicted that India is going to be absolutely devastated. Well, that prediction was a year late, yeah. <laughs> a year too early. So. Uh, again, I'll say it, it is, it is, it is impossible to get it right, but you can improve it again, based on what has happened so far. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. But yeah. So like, you know, any kind of new mutations, like, you know, uh, how viral the, the, the virus is, right. Like you can adjust your R naught values, uh, actually calculate those R naught values based off of that. Right. So, you know, uh, again, it's a matter of factors. Uh, which we have much more information about. And, you know, so this is a sensational question. You know, mm -hmm. seeing the other models, seeing what's going on, can you predict when can we see something of a down peak across the world where we can see it ending? Uh, are you asking for a personal opinion? Personal opinion, which may be based on, you know, what you've been reading and what you have been probably, probably mm -hmm. calculating. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I don't think it's going to end until vaccinations are done. Uh, and like you said, right, like in the beginning, 70% mark is the sweet spot. Uh, so that's also the mark that people suggest for herd immunity. Uh, that's exactly the number that we should be targeting because herd immunity doesn't really exist. We all already know antibodies disappear, right? So the only way to uh, get over with this is vaccinations. And I think at least in case of Canada, I think we are looking at around September that we will be done with this. <laughs> so, Pradyumna, mm -hmm. I mean, how is it in Toronto? How is it in Canada right now? Um, well, see, being an, an Indian immigrant in Toronto, um, according to me, at least the way I look at things, it seems to be like the government seems to have done a stellar job handling the, the COVID crisis. Um, and uh, also, th there's also a little bit, uh, there, there's also a factor of like, you know, people themselves that uh, people in within Toronto also respect a lot of rules and regulations that are enforced due to COVID, uh, at least most of them. <laughs> there, there are obviously people who don't like to believe in COVID itself. Uh, but by and large, uh, yeah, like it, it has been, I, I, I think the effort from the government and the people themselves has been pretty good. So, so when you talk uh, about effort, when you talk about effort, sorry to interrupt you, when you talk about effort, when, how does it look on the ground? 
I mean, how do you see it and how do you compare it with what's going on in other parts of the world to give us some comparison? So uh, actually, I, I think right now we're just having, at least in my province, uh, Ontario and where, where I live, I think there, are, there have been only about uh, uh, 3,000 and so cases recently. And this is supposed to be our second wave. So, and we are, and we have already, we are already going down from that peak. Uh, so even given the amount of people, I think we're talking about like at least at least six million people in the city itself, about like you know 1,500 cases within Toronto City. Uh, that's not a lot, right? So uh, uh, and a lot of people requiring hospitalization is also not really much. So it hasn't really overwhelmed the the medical the whole healthcare system as of now. Uh, but there is stress definitely uh, because. Uh, See, it's it's not just about uh, admitting patients into a room, right? Like, so if hospitals have to have like complete wings dedicated to to COVID themselves. So even though you're just filling them half, only filling like half of the beds, the rest of the beds are going to remain empty. You're not going to put anybody else, right? So, so of course the system is screened. I've been hearing that like you know a lot of people's uh, surgeries, at least non-essential surgeries, have been uh, pushed forward. Uh, so there is a struggle, uh, but it's nowhere close to what we are seeing in, uh, especially in, in, in South Asian countries and specifically in, in Delhi. So, so, you know, when we look at people on the street, are they wearing masks? And if they're not wearing masks, is the government, you know, being very strict about it? Are there mass gatherings? Are there people getting together? What do you, how do you see the situation? Right uh, now? Is there a lockdown? There are, uh, yeah, so there are odd occurrences of people like you know congregated together, but they make the news, right? So if they are making the news, that means it's <laughs> it's not happening that often. So they're making you know, news for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So so that's so it's it's so that 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 means it's not really happening that often. So and like just my observation has been at least in the area that I live because you know we can't really travel that much. <laughs> So at least in the area that I live, people are actually very, uh, uh, I mean, they take this very seriously. Uh, and even if you're like walking down the same, uh, like, you know, like same footpath, right? Uh, same sidewalk. Uh, if, if you're just like, you know, walking across each other, people would try and make the maximum distance, uh, try and keep the maximum distance from yourself. Like, like little things like that, right? Uh, so I, I think that that matters a lot. And like, yeah, like when it comes to masks, People are following that rule to the teeth. Uh, you cannot even enter a grocery store without having a mask or sanitizing your hand. And like and, they will make sanitize your hands right when you enter your grocery store. So is, <laughs> yeah, it's great. Is there a lockdown there? I mean, is there a strict lockdown? How is uh, it, or does it? Is a dynamic lockdown yeah. that keeps changing according to cases? How does it work? How does the lockdown work there? So, so no, no, there is no dynamic lockdown per se. Uh, so th there is a lockdown in a way that restaurants are closed, right? Parks have an advisory for them that, okay, not a lot of people should be allowed there. You know, uh, like, like I said, like grocery stores, I think they are only functioning at about, uh, about I think 25%, don't quote me on that number, or 25% of the total capacity of the whole uh, stores. Um, and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, public, uh, like you know, offices are closed, right? Most of them are. are most of the things are happening online, um, including immigration, which is something I was, <laughs> I was personally involved in. So uh, yeah, so like there's there's been a soft lockdown, but there, there's nothing like a curfew or anything like that. You can still go out whenever you want. So, but recently they did try to enforce one. Uh, and I think it was for the right reason. It was coming from the right place. Uh, uh, and they were going for a really strict lockdown that people could not even like uh, get out of their house for non-essential reasons. And police would be given the power to actually pull them over and ask them, which is considered something very big and, and, and a huge violation of personal rights in, in Canada, at least. So that didn't really go well with the, uh, with the, with the people themselves. So I think that was pushing it too much. Uh, uh, so, and even, even the police came out and said that, you know what, guys, we're not going to do this. <laughs> so even the police said like, okay, even though we have the power, we're not going to do this. Uh, 
Understood. So, so yeah, so, so I think it's, uh, so I want to yeah, so it, yeah. So yeah, if I want to yeah. ask you about testing, how's the testing going? Does the government pay for your testing? You pay for your testing? Is it in kits? Is it to walk in somewhere? At how often do you get tested? Or is there some compulsory testing for travel or anything? How is testing business going on in Canada? Okay. Uh, so when it comes to okay, so first thing first, uh, let me tell you briefly about what Canada's healthcare system is. So Canada's healthcare system is divided into different uh, health regions, right? So every health region has its has its own system, right? And that is all of these health regions are supported by the state government or the provincial government, right? Federal governments are not responsible for the specific healthcare regions of a uh, state. Okay. Next thing that I would like to point out is that uh, healthcare in Canada is universal. It is completely socialized. You almost never pay anything. Uh, if you're working for you know in corporate or in, or like you know any other workplace that which provides you benefits, uh, you will you can get a brain surgery for free, uh, literally. Uh, so now building off of that. Uh, when it comes to testing themselves, uh, there are a lot of testing centers around. So especially if you are in a city like Toronto, at any if you just put a pin anywhere on the map, uh, within I, I'll say five kilometers, uh, and I think five kilometers is also I'm, I'm pushing it. I think it will be even less. You will have at least one testing center, if not more. So I I did go for testing because I did suspect that I had uh, COVID and there are a lot of elderly people living in my building. So I, I thought that I should really go and at least know if I have it. So I, I did go and uh, there was again, like, you know, the whole, uh, basically a whole floor was specifically designated just for COVID patients and COVID testing. All you have to, so there were no long lines. All you had to do was just go stand in a line. Uh, they will, uh, and the whole process took, uh, Took about 15 minutes. They'll check your oxygen levels. Uh, they'll do a nasal swab, right? Uh, they'll check your blood pressure, things of that sort, and then uh, they'll basically let you go uh, right after that. Uh, and you'll get your test results uh, within uh, uh, within 24 hours. It's Great. not like the test that test that we are doing in in India. And I've been hearing a lot of complaints regarding that. It's I think only 80 percent accurate. Uh, so. It's not like that. We're not having that issue. So is it Canada. a is it a antigen rapid antigen rapid test or the RT PCR that you're talking about or it's both? It's it, it's not the RT PCR test. The, the, I think RT PCR test is the one that's happening in India right now, right? No, we uh, are having we are having both actually. RT PCR is the one which takes 24 hours and rapid antigen is the okay. one which happens like. Sorry, sorry, yeah, the one that's taking 24 hours is probably the one. Yeah. <laughs> because okay. forgive me, I'm, I'm not very. No worries. I'm not no worries. very. So, so, uh, so the next question I want to ask uh, you is about vaccination. You know, vaccination is a mm -hmm. pain point for a lot of countries right now, and you know, even we are facing some shortages. So, have you got vaccinated? How is vaccination going on? How does the government, you know, calculate who needs to get va vaccinated or who does not right now? So, tell me about vaccination in Ontario, Canada. Okay, so, uh, so vaccination started in Ontario. Uh, in January, I believe. Uh, that's when the first few doses started coming in. Uh, so they had, they had quite a strategy, and I think that that it was a it was a really good one. So they had different phases for the vaccination program. So first phase was, of course, uh, getting the getting vaccinated the getting the elderly vaccinated first, and your frontline workers, right? So they were definitely part of the first phase, and of course, the first phase took really long. I think. Uh, uh, about like three and a half months or so until like uh, mid-April, uh, we were just getting done with uh, the elderly and the frontline workers, uh, simply because the vaccine supply was freely erratic, right? Uh, after that, uh, they opened up uh, vaccinations for people, I believe over 40. Uh, so, sorry, no, I think it was over 45. So over 45. And of course, still, if no none of the frontline workers have uh, have gotten the vaccine, and frontline workers also include Uber drivers, by the way. Uh, I'm just, I'm just. There's a really broad definition of frontline workers as well. So, um, 
so those folks were in the next phase and also everyone 18 plus in hotspots right so second phase was everybody over 45 and also everyone in hotspots right so i actually live just one postal code away and postal codes here are really small in canada so just 500 meters away from me if i was living 500 meters away i would have gotten vaccinated already uh but sadly i don't which is actually a good thing i'm not in the hot spot but this was basically the second phase, right? hot spots and above 45. So that means now there's, next... there's very strict surveillance of places as to where the cases are and where the cases are not. Sorry to interrupt you, but you know, you tell us about the surveillance. Yeah. So, so, so how, how, how they track that is that whenever you actually go for testing, right, they're going to ask you for your address. Uh, and that's kind of how they keep a record of like, you know, where, uh, the uh, most amount of cases are really occurring. And, uh, a lot of this data is actually publicly available. Uh, you you can simply go to Ontario's health uh, data and uh, uh, website and actually get this data. Not real time. I think it's there's a lag of one week. But yeah. So so you know universal vaccination. When do you see it happening? When do you see like at least seventy percent of the population of Canada, especially Ontario, getting vaccinated? So uh, actually, as of now, 50% of the uh, adults in Canada are already done with uh, their first dose. Okay. So that's great. Uh, I think uh, I think within another um, couple of months, uh, at least everyone would have had, uh, I mean, everyone is impossible, but uh, most of them, 70% plus uh, adults will have the uh, first dose of vaccination. The trick is to be able to get the second dose because the supplies are really erratic. Okay, okay. And, and as you said, is, this is also universal, so the government pays for your vaccine. Is it true? Oh, yes. It's all paid. No questions asked. Okay, 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 okay. So, you know, now this important question that I need to ask you is about the augment, augmenting of the capacity in hospitals. So, are the hospitals ready? Do you see, like, stadiums which are on standby? Do you see big buildings on standby to be converted in case there is a surge because in Delhi we saw a certain surge and we were suddenly out of hospital. So is the Canadian government, especially in Ontario, prepared for a massive surge suddenly? I don't think they are. Uh, but uh, I think that's also because then there is no way they're going to see something like uh, what what's what <coughs> happening in India. In Delhi. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think so because the population density is not there. People are maintaining by themselves voluntarily very strict, uh, like they are adhering to the COVID restrictions. And uh, uh, and also, like if you look at it medically, like from what I understand my from my meager knowledge of uh, biological sciences, the variants that are there in Canada are not really half as bad as what we are seeing in, in India. Okay. They're not as virulent. They're not as deadly. Uh, the, I think the worst one we have is the uh, the UK variant, which is itself is nothing as compared to what we are seeing in India. So, okay, and and you know, like this is the most important part of you know this whole conversation that we have had. If there are things that we can learn from Canada and Ontario province, what are the things that we must absolutely note down and implement? I think uh, I think the so the, so there are a couple of things right uh, and I'm I'm not sure how applicable that would be to the situation in India but uh, I, I think the top one would be uh, that 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 the that the whole uh, story the COVID story right that should have been from the grassroots level. Okay. Not just big announcements on TV, right, on the radio and the, like things of that. So that 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 eventually people people might get scared for like a couple of weeks or so. Then after a while, they're just gonna be like, you know, like immune to it, right? Like it, it's just, just they're just gonna be oblivious to it, right? Right. So again, like I'm stretching it. I'm not a psychologist, but at least that's what my understanding is. So I think that should have been more at the grassroots level, right? So they are like your local clinics should have. Uh, had the infrastructure, right? Uh, your like, you know, your gram panchayats, right? Like they should be the one who should be promoting social distancing, right? Uh, they should be given the liberty of distributing masks and things of that sort, right? So at a really grassroots level, because six, seventy percent of the Indian population is rural, right? Let's okay. let's let's face it, right? Like that's 
and and we don't even know what's happening right now but Absolutely. i won't get into that yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so i think that is the that is the biggest one and the second would definitely be uh see see in india everybody is so scared of a lockdown and rightly so rightly so like people's livelihood so people's uh, livelihoods will be affected right uh, if if you really go go ahead with the kind of uh, lockdown we actually saw uh, right at the beginning of of the covid situation and, and unfolding in in india right so uh, so people are scared understandable but uh, like you know we 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 keep talking about like you know i i think the indian government has built certain infrastructure to be able to dispense uh, uh to be able to dispense a lot of benefits right they have provided a lot of a uh, lot of bank accounts right they have like you know linked them up with our card so they can actually identify people right it it could have been it could have been possible like i am no financial analyst or an economist but it could have been possible to help the people directly uh uh to to really support them through this uh, whole process right because Uh, i mean if somebody if people if somebody has really literally run out of food to eat like like if somebody is in delhi or literally run out of food to eat they are going to go back to their villages so that at least they have shelter on their head, like you know like basic things in life so that's something you cannot stop right like like what w- what can you do you cannot stop and that is going to spread the virus absolutely so uh, again like i i understand we are talking in hindsight yeah uh, right we are definitely talking in hindsight uh we we at the time and this this whole thing unfolded we did not know how bad or how not so bad this virus is really going to be right uh, we we had no idea so yeah i mean i, I think these are a couple of things that that i, I think um, i think would be really helpful and okay 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 that was yeah. you know, a great lot of information and you know you took so much time out you know you've covered so many important issues and you told us about how it's happening in ontario how canadian system is totally universal you know which a lot of countries can learn from you know no questions asked anybody goes he gets vaccinated for free the government pays for it you've also told us about you know postal code based surveillance and postal post code based uh, you know hotspot creation which is based on surveillance and you know like testing within every 5 kilometers which is a very big deal and you've also told us about uh, vaccine uh, you know how vaccination happened for uber drivers also how vaccination how the frontline workers definition has be, has be, has you know been made vast enough to include a lot of people who are actually on the frontline and you know hmm. apart from that you know uh, this whole uh, enlightenment that you've given us regarding models regarding how models are made regarding what is the input data required to make it more accurate you know it's going to be absolutely important for all our viewers to understand and learn and you know not be fixed to models question models and you know see how these models can be um, uh, accurate and you know uh, of course for the government these models are very important to you know have the future policy have the next steps to take so you know i really really thank you and i would request you to sum all of all of this up and you know uh, in 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 this question of hope that i'm going to ask you what is this one thing that you see happening or you wish could happen to the world and to india especially huh. i wish india was a lot more prepared we had one whole year uh and we we declared victory too soon uh people gave all kinds of reason that we have vaccination so tb and that's why we're doing good i mean come on <laughs> right so so i i really wish that we wouldn't have we would have been humble we would have been made to be would have not made bold claims to the world that we have won and we are going to save everybody else whereas we were not doing <laughs> as well ourselves so i i wish we were prepared uh we were humble and uh, when it comes to the whole world i really hope that uh, people did not make covid political uh that that would have been really great because th- i to, to me at least this was the test of globalization uh which i don't which i think the world failed okay okay miserably yeah thank you thank you so much pradyum 
it is it was great to have you and you know you spoke so much about uh, so many important things and i'm going i'm sure everybody is going to you know really really learn from and you know uh, think about what you just told us and i thank you and you know i would request you to tell our viewers to please subscribe to the channel and share this video <laughs> everyone please uh, subscribe to uh, raja singh the architect and please share this video uh, hope this helps a lot of people thank you thank you thank you, thank you so thank much you.